Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning program. Okay, so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for waking us up this morning. Thank you so much for being so good, so kind, so wonderful to us. Thank you. There's no way in the world that we can say thank you enough for all that you do to us. The miracle that happens in our chest every second of our lives, with our hearts beating and the fact that we can breathe fresh air, an autonomous response that happens naturally, Father, you're behind it all. You keep us going and we thank you so much. So as we spend time today, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and help us to use it to your name, honor and glory. We thank you so much in Jesus' name, amen. So what I wanted to do today, and I pray about these things before we bring the program, so Lord, give us wisdom of what to share. But there is an interview I wanted you to hear, just a part of it. Now, the interview is with Dr. Cowan. Now, keep in mind, he doesn't have, well, he has mentioned the Bible, but he doesn't really have the three angels' messages that I know of and the spirit of prophecy. So he's not going to have... He's not going to be on point with most of his, what he's talking about, but he, he does have the history. And I want to look at that because the enemy uses, he mixes truth with error. Um, so we have to filter out the foolishness, but the history is the history. And I just want you to see that. Now, when we studied the germ theory during camp meeting, Dr. Sharps mentioned he did some of the history. He talked about um, Louis Pasteur, and I didn't realize there was someone before Louis Pasteur that was doing all of this stuff. Um, but Pasteur and Antoine Bechamp, these guys were contemporaries with Ellen White. I shared some of this some weeks ago. But when you understand the history, kind of open you sh- your eyes. Now, why is this important because the enemy, now keep this in mind, this part I'm hoping you know already what I'm about to tell you now. The enemy has set up systems of this world and God is, God has to allow him to do what he's going to do, right? Now, of course, to certain limits and because God's people get protection when you keep the commandments and so forth. We're told that. But the enemy has, he has to make his case. He's saying that no one can keep God's law. No one wants to. It doesn't make any sense having it. When in truth, God's law protects us. But he's, okay, so he's going on and you know, um, so he, all he has to use really are these world systems. Now think about that. He has these world systems and you get into the system and as long as you comply and so forth, he's fine. But when you, when you understand too much or as you, you become a person who can put out information that he doesn't want you to put out, then you become a danger. Now, let, let me give an example of that. If you remember when Malcolm X was part of the nation of Islam, and he was their, yeah, he was their biggest speaker about, you know, what the nation wanted to do and what their beliefs were and so forth and the goals and their objectives. And for years, he was, you know, their main spokesman. But when he went to Mecca and saw for himself what was going on, he came back with a new perspective. And so now he was seen a little too much. And he became technically a threat to the nation. And we'll see what the enemy does. So if, you know, he puts you in a, he puts you in a system. But when you start going beyond that system, you start seeing more than um, what they want you to see. You can become like a threat. And what the enemy wants to do is get rid of you. And technically, that's what he did with Malcolm. Because 
Malcolm started seeing, because it, within the nation, yeah, he saw the history of what, how whites were treating blacks and so forth. You get all that. But it was that system he was in was causing division and almost hatred for the man who did what he did to you. When he went to Mecca and saw all the brethren coming together and so forth, it was basically killing that hatred. So it was like taking him on a different path. And he came back, basically, I, I guess, in a sense, starting his own movement and um, different than what he was doing with the nation. And, you know, they saw fit to get rid of him. Now, that's how it works. Now, even in our system today, with like in... Um, Satan is involved now with all the systems of the world. Let me give you another couple of examples. My wife works, well, she used to work in the educational system. And her specialty, you know, is learning disabilities. Now, when you're working in that system, they expect you to work a certain way and to follow certain guidelines. But Lorreen was saying, wait a minute, some of this stuff is not right. And she saw that. And, you know, when not most people don't see that. They're in the system. They're part of the system. They're almost programmed into the system. But if you get to the point, especially when you're reading the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy and you're understanding certain things, you say, wait a minute, this is not, this is not right. This is, this is not God's way. It's like when I used to work years ago. I used to work in a restaurant. And we'd feed you know, give people and these heavy meals at night, steaks and so forth, and you know, you're serving them and blah, blah, blah. That's part of the system. That's what the world does. But that's not God's system. God's system is that you eat heavy in the morning and nothing, or if anything, very light at night. So the world system is going to be different from God's system. In the medical world, you have people who, who have, I know of a doctor, she's been on SWM radio before. And um, if you listened to that interview, you would know Sister Stephanie interviewed Dr. Jennifer Daniels. And she started seeing things in the system that weren't right. And she saw that a lot of the drugs that um, she, they recommended that she prescribe um, were not working. When she did away with it, her patients did so much better to the point where they had to come to her office and tell her she needs to prescribe X amount of drugs per week to keep her license. And she says, wait a minute, you know, these are my patients. I want to see them healthy. And what you're telling me to do is not, it's not good. It's not right. And it's a longer story than that, but she actually had to lose her, she lost her license and had to move to another country to work. So when you're in this, they, they put this system together and you're in this thing, they don't want you to see, Satan doesn't want you to see past what he did. I hope you're getting this. This is a little on the deep side because we... We're, this is ingrained in us. I mean, because this is all we knew since growing up. Moses was in the system of the Egyptians. And when God took him out at the age of 40, he had to unlearn what he learned so that God can use him. Don't think that with the 144,000, that's not going to happen again. Because we're in the systems of this world. And we will have to unlearn what we've learned so God can use us. And he's going to use us in a mighty way. I would dare say, I don't, you know, I'd hate to say mightier than what Moses did. Because what Moses did was amazing. But you have to vindicate the name of God, the name of Christ, and do so without a mediator. That's huge and never 
has it been done by a sinner, especially on this level with 144,000 of them in Earth's history? It's never been done. And when it happens, it's going to be talked about for the ceaseless ages of eternity, and you have to get ready for it. Part of getting ready for it means unlearning what we've learned. So what happened when this whole pandemic or plandemic, whatever you want to call it, came out, I was suspicious of it, but I was suspicious of it mostly because I know that God has given me a gift of discernment. And I've, I've learned to rely on it. I may not have all the answers. But my defense is my faith. I have faith that when something is not right and my conscience is pricked about something, even though I may not have all the details, I've learned to trust, you know, I better stay back and just watch and pray before I delve into anything that man has to say. So that was that. But then some time went by and when I heard about some studies. Now, I heard about this, I don't know how many weeks into this thing, but I heard that they had done some studies that, um, well, before that, I heard about the studies that were done in Wuhan, and I saw some things were not right, because there, when you have a virus, you're supposed to isolate the virus. And once you isolate it, you're supposed to purify it, and then take it and put it into... Um, healthy subjects and see if you can make the person sick and see if you can do, you know, replicate your theory because you've, you know, you can't just come up with a theory without testing it. You got to test it, know, you know, and then do it with a number of, of subjects that you're working on and so forth or have a control group or whatever, or do your double blind study. When I found out they didn't do any of that, I said, that's kind of weird. Now it's not the first time. Experts in this world do weird things, <laughs> but hey, it is what it is. But um, I said, well, something is not right. You know, you smell a rat. It wasn't until later on that I heard about some studies that were done years ago where they tried to take germs from an individual and put it into a healthy individual and make them sick. And they couldn't make, they couldn't make the um, healthy individual sick. Now, I heard, well actually, when I heard that they couldn't prove the contagion, I kind of dismissed it at first. Not that I dismissed it, but I just didn't really research it. But then, when I heard it again, I had to look into it this time. So. When I found out, this was in 1919, February, well, December 1918, and in February and March of 1919, one medical team in Boston working for, and I'm, this is from uh, a book called The Invisible Rainbow. It says, one medical team in Boston working for the United States Public Health Service tried to infect 100 healthy volunteers. Between the ages of 18 and 25, their efforts were impressive. Um, it says, we collected the material and mucus sec secretions of the mouth and nose and throat and bronchi from cases of the disease and transferred this to our volunteers. We always obtained the material in the same way. The patient with fever in bed had a large shadow tray-like arrangement before him or her. And we wash out one nostril with some sterile salt solutions using perhaps 5 cc, which is allowed to run into the tray. And that nostril is blown vigorously into the tray. This is repeated with the other nostril. The patient then gargles with some of the solution. Next, we obtain some bronchial mucus through coughing and we swab the mucus surface of each, um, each nares and also the mucous surface of the throat. 
each one of the volunteers received 6 cc of the mixed stuff that I have subscribed. I have described, I'm sorry. They received it into each nostril, received it into, thro into the throat, on the eye, and when you think that 6 cc in it was, 6 cc in all was used, you will understand that some of it was swallowed, but none of them took sick. And a further experiment with new volunteers and donors, the salt solution was illuminated, um, and with cotton swabs, the material was transferred directly from nose to nose and from throat to throat using donors in the first, second, or third day of the disease. None of these volunteers who received the material thus directly transferred from cases took sick in any way. All of the volunteers received at least two and some of them three shots as they expressed it. In a further experiment, 20 cc of blood from each of the five sick donors were mixed and injected into each volunteer. None of them took sick in any way. Then we collected a lot of mucus material from the upper respiratory tract and filtered it through um, mandular filters. This filtrate was injected into 10 volunteers, each one receiving 3.5 cc's sub subcutaneously, and none of these took sick in any way. All right, going to the next part here, just to show you what was going on. Then a further attempt was made to transfer the disease in the natural way, using fresh volunteers and donors. The volunteer was led up uh, to the bedside of the patient he that he was introduced. Well, he was introduced to this patient. Uh, he sat down alongside the bed of the patients. They shook hands, and by instructions, he got as close as he conveniently could and talked for five minutes. At the end of five minutes, the patient breathed out as hard as he could while the volunteer muzzle to muzzle in accordance with his instructions about two inches between the two received this inspired breath and at the same time was breathing in as the patient breathed out. After they had done this for five done this for five times, the patient coughed directly into the face of the volunteer face to face five different times. Then he moved to the next patient whom we had selected and repeated this and so on until this volunteer had that sort of contact with ten different cases of influenza in different stages of the of the disease, mostly fresh cases, none of them more than three days old. And still, none took sick in any way. They tried all of this with horses, you know, putting a bag over the horse's head and getting all of the germs that they could get and then put it on the head of a, of a healthy horse and tried to get him sick. They couldn't do it. So it tells us how we're created. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Think about that. Think about how fearfully and wonderfully made each of us are. And so what Bachant was trying to show us is that we do not get sick because of germs, um, bacteria, um, whether they're bacterial or viral. We are sick because of the terrain is what he's saying. And that goes right along with the spirit of prophecy. So in other words, the chant was saying that are there, because of what was happening, for example, like if you see, um, if you see a, a virus or, or you see germs in something, they're saying that automatically that is what caused us to get sick. When really what the chant was saying, the reason why you see the bacteria there or the virus is because they're there to clean up. They're there to clean up. So um, I'm going to let, um, I'm going to give you this interview so that you can hear what Dr. Cowan's, how he explains it. I like the way he explains at least this part. And, um, and then see if it makes more sense to you of how this works. It's, it's like having a fish tank. And the, you have a fish tank with dirty water and because the water is dirty, you're saying, okay, all the fish need to have a vaccine. They all have to be vaccinated. 
rather than just saying, let's clean the water. So I want you to get this because, because what the enemy was doing is he was setting up the stage for the system he wanted to promote medicine with. In other words, uh, these creatures out there can come and attack us. They can invade e even healthy people. There's nothing you can do about it. And the best way to handle that is to get a vaccine or take drugs and so forth. Whereas Bachat was saying the opposite. Let me read something to you real quick. So um, this might make it a little clearer. So um, in 19th century France, while Pasteur was advocating the notion of germs as the cause of disease, another French scientist named Antoine Bachat was advocating a conflicting theory known as the cellular theory of disease. Bachat's cellular theory is almost complete opposite to that of Pasteur's, but Champ noted that these germs that Pasteur was so terrified of were opportunistic in nature. They were everywhere and even existed inside of us in a symbiotic relationship. But Champ noticed that in his noticed in his research that it was only when the tissue of the host became damaged or compromised that these germs began to manifest as a prevailing symptom not the cause of disease. To prevent illness, Bachamp advocated not the killing of germs, but the cultivation of health through diet, hygiene, and healthy lifestyle practices such as fresh air and exercise. So this is what Sister White was saying. The idea is that if the person has a strong immune system and a good tissue quality, or terrain as Bachamp called it, the germs will not manifest in the person and they will have good health. It is only when their health starts to decline due to personal neglect and poor lifestyle choices that they became victim to infections. So they came from the inside. So what the germs do, they feed on, on what's hurting you. They're trying to clean you. They're trying to detox you. And Satan doesn't want that. That's why he wants you to stop. Let's kill the germs. Let's stop the fever. The fever is there to help you. If the virus is there trying to work through a fever, it's just there trying to cleanse you and get you clean so you don't get through the, you don't get this disease again. But Satan doesn't want that. Um, in this reading, they use um, they say if you can you can see this when a group of people go hiking in the woods. It often seems that the mosquitoes attack only one or two people out of the group. As it turns out. Is always the same person that always gets attacked by the mosquitoes. This person is usually the one who catches the latest flu and has the weakest immune system. This is because these germs, including insects, are opportunistic in nature and only attack the weak. To treat illness, Bachamp's cellular theory also applied. Bachamp was less concerned about killing the infection and focused more on restoring the health of the patient's body through healthy lifestyle choices. But Champ saw that the infection as a footnote to the state of illness and not the primary cause. As the person restored health through diet, hygiene, and detoxification, the infection went away on its own without needing measures to kill it. Now, Pasteur and Bechamp had a long and often bitter rivalry regarding who was right about the true cause of disease a true cause of illness. Ultimately, Pasteur's ideas were accepted by society and Bechamp was pretty, mo pretty much forgotten. The next, the practice of Western medicine is based on Pasteur's gem, germ phobia, which gives rise to the use of vaccinations, antibiotics, and other antimicrobials. The irony is that towards the end of his life, Pasteur renounced the germ theory and admitted that Bachamp was right all along. In the 1920s, medical historians also discovered that most of Pasteur's theories were plagiarized from Bachamp's early research work. Um, so the key is that Bachamp is trying to say, treat the patient, not the infection. But the medical world is rich due to what they got from Louis Pasteur. And from what they're saying, Louis Pasteur wasn't even that great of a scientist. Um, but they took that and ran with it. And now through the drugs and antibi antibiotics and also um, vaccinations and so forth, 
they can make so much money and the vaccine that they plan on coming out with, a lot of money is going to be made. So what I'm thinking is, now I feel this is important to understand because um, the Bible says that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. I don't think we need to be deceived. Uh, we see what's going on and people are out there wearing the mask, right? Fine, fine. In fact, we played a clip with Nicholas the other day. Remember this. Remember what was said. He said, as I have been saying for some time now, the mask is nothing more than a way to cultivate the mindset of the people to accept the mark of the beast. Then he goes on to say, uh, he said, the people are moved to wear masks, wear the mask in two ways. People wear it, number one, they either wear it because they agree in their minds that it actually works, even though science says otherwise. Or number two, people know that it's all a lie and they wear it because they can't buy groceries in some stores without it. Or in some cases they can't. Uh, they wear it to keep their jobs. Now, Mark of the Beast, according to prophecy, it also offers two ways to accept it. Number one, people receive the mark in the forehead because they agree in their minds that Sunday is the Sabbath, even though the Bible says otherwise. Or number two, people know what the Bible says, but have fear and no faith are forced to receive the mark in their hands so as to buy and sell or even escape the guillotine. That's what he says. He says, remember the mask is not the mark. It only means by which it is only it is only the means by which the government that are in bed, the governments that are embedded with the man of sin in Rome can cultivate the global mindset to receive the mark of the beach when it is finally enforced by law. So, wearing the mask is not a sin. They're just trying to wear people down to get them used to doing as they say so that later on when they enforce the mark, they can be easily moved to obey them. So, stay in your Bibles. Stay on your knees. Stand firm in Christ. This is what he shared the other day. So, I believe that the enemy is using all of this to his advantage it's symbolizing um, compliance. If Satan were to come out and say, listen, we're changing the world. There's going to be a new world order. We want you to wear a mask in terms of to show compliance and so forth. How many people will, will go with that? You, you're not going to get a lot of people doing that. But if he can deceive you, it is all deception that he's using. That's what he knows. That's what he does. That's what he knows and that's what he does. So what I'm going to do right now, let's go to break. And when we come back, we're going to share a part of this interview that was done with Dr. Cowan. I want you to hear what he has to say. You're listening to SWM Radio. 